Good morning and welcome to this Institute for Government In Conversation event, which we are hosting back in the IFG building in, uh, for the first time in what is quite a long time, obviously. I'm Catherine Haddon, I'm Senior Fellow here at the Institute for Government and I'm delighted to be joined by Gavin Barwell. Lord Barwell, uh, Theresa May's Chief of Staff from 2017 to 2019 and author of a new book, Chief of Staff Notes from Downing Street, which tells the inside story of his time in number 10. Uh, we're going to be live tweeting during the event from our IFG events accounts uh, and using the hashtag IFG Barwell. And please do send in your questions at any time uh, during the event using the Q&A function. So, Gavin, thank you very much for joining us here today. Thanks for asking me. We've got a lovely picture. Yeah. Uh, a bit of reminiscing there for you of uh, time in number 10. Uh, you would have been there in the background, but that's not you uh, hiding behind the scenes there. Uh, just before we delve into the book, uh, and obviously we'll get to Brexit uh, later, a very topical topic at the moment, we had the Conservative Conference last week, mm -hmm. um, an event that you say in the book is very stage-managed, uh, quite focused on the party, MPs and the media. Boris Johnson even had his very own personal stage yep. uh, there. When you look at him, striding through the conference, breezing through a joke-laden speech, enjoying such a large majority... I've got to ask, did a bit of you want the set behind him to fall down? <laughs> Perhaps a cough, somebody no. running onto stage? No, 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 I wouldn't wish that on anybody. <laughs> um, I mean, he's, he's earned that position through the election victory in 2019. And from my point of view, I would have loved to have the chance to work with Theresa if she had that kind of uh, freedom that a large parliamentary majority gives you. But no, um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't wish what happened in... 2017. But it didn't bring back any sort of awkward flashbacks of the, your no, experience. And, uh, so 2018 kind of purged those memories. Yeah. My, I, I say in the book, I had like one conference from hell and one that, one that was a much happier uh, memory. Yeah. Um, okay, well, let's talk a little bit first about why you wrote the book. I mean, it's always a bit of a cliche to say, why, why did you decide to write this book? But it's quite important here because, I mean, even before Theresa May left office, her legacy was something that people were already jumping on. Um, and quite negatively, including from her own party, uh, you know, the entire leadership election was on how people would do things differently. Yeah. Um, how much of this was about you wanting to put out what you were doing, your role, and how much was it about dealing with her legacy and perhaps revising that history? So it's a bit of both. I mean, I agonised for quite a long time about writing the book because obviously it involves going through a whole load of quite painful memories. Um, but ultimately, I think there were several strong arguments for doing it. First of all, whatever your views on her premiership, this was one of the most important periods of post-war British politics. And given that she uh, hasn't written her own memoirs and I was there in the room at all the key moments, you know, at the risk of being somewhat pompous, it is an, it's an important story that I felt ought to be told. Mm. Uh, and certainly part of my... Uh, part of what I was trying to achieve was to give people maybe a, a more nuanced view of what her legacy is. Uh, I start the book, I hope, fairly honestly and candidly and say it is a story of my failure uh, because as Chief of Staff, your job is to keep the Prime Minister in number 10. And you can't get around the fact that her prime job was to get Brexit done and she wasn't able to do that. Mm. But, but I think there are some important things that she did get achieved and I wanted to highlight those and to explain why she was trying to deliver a compromise on Brexit. Mm. And then the, the other object was writing for people maybe who don't have quite the expertise that you do in how yeah. government works to try and give people an insight into what goes on behind that famous black door and, and how the government of our country actually works. Yeah. So there were a number of different uh, things at play there and I hope the book manages to, to achieve those three, three goals. Well, I think even from, you know, it's very kind of you to say that, but from even from our point of view, actually understanding that chief of staff role, what goes on in number 10, because it can be very difficult for people to, to appreciate. There's often this focus is on the prime minister when they've got a large majority, but even in her position as being very powerful, being able to get lots of things done. But actually, it's a fairly small office, yeah. you know, uh, not so many levers of power. We'll get into that in a, in a bit more detail in a minute. But I just want to start probing on the chief of staff role, actually, um, and who answers to them, what they do. Uh, how much did you understand that at the start of the job? And what did you do to sort of learn about the job? So I, mean, I remember when, when she offered me the job, I asked if there was a job description and she kind of smiled and said, no, you, you sit outside my office and you, you give me advice, essentially. So I, I think by definition, there can't be a job description mm. because what you do 
will depend on who the Prime Minister is and what they want from a Chief of Staff, your, your own skills and experience, what you bring to the job, uh, the wider structure of Number 10, who the Principal Private Secretary is, the Cabinet Secretary, how those relationships work out, and the political situation, what the, what the demands of mm. the situation uh, actually are. So it was very much a case of learning from the moment that I arrived there where, where I felt I could best contribute. Mm. Well, uh, can I just ask a bit about that, about adjusting to the principal? Um, you know, she had had very different chief of staff, two people in the role, Nick Timothy and Fiona Hill. And, and you say in the book that when you got in, you started to discover just how frustrated people had been. You know, once they had fallen from power, it sort of started to come out about the frustrations. Yeah. And we were hearing that as well about sort of bottlenecks building up, because a lot of it is basically seeing everything that the prime minister sees, and that's a huge amount of paperwork. So was it entirely about adjusting to her, or did you also think about changing her working practices to address some of those issues? So I think, I think number 10 has to work around the style of the Prime Minister, mm. but I definitely thought about what can we do, how can we structure the day uh, and the way the building works in a way that makes the best possible use of her time. So one of the things I talk about is the, the morning meeting mm. that would start her day, which I felt there were too many people in the room and often it was, it was too focused on what was in the media that day and also you know, everybody giving their opinion. So we set up a sort of pre-meeting where we tried to work out, okay, if these are the decisions we need the PM to make at the morning meeting, mm. what's everyone's views? And can we shorten the actual time with her, where either if we're all unanimous, we can say this is the unanimous view of the staff, or if there are differences of opinion, she can hear from two or three people setting out the different views they have about what the decision should be. Yeah, and there were also a number of other changes uh, that went on. I mean, she had continuity in terms of Peter Hill, yep. uh, the civil servant, the principal private secretary uh, who was closest to her. But did you also think about, you know, how to remodel the wider number 10 team, changes that needed to be made, and how much control did you have over that? Uh, 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 yeah, I mean, ultimately, obviously, it's for the prime minister to decide, yeah. but I obviously was in a position where I could give her advice on what I thought. Mm. Probably the biggest change was, was setting up this um, legislative affairs team yes uh, yeah. because I by background headed by Nikki da Costa headed by Nikki da Costa right yeah. so by background obviously I had I was unusual I'm the only former chief of staff who'd been an MP and a minister before getting that job and part of my ministerial experience probably my formative experience had been in the whips office mm. and what I'd seen there was that number 10 didn't really understand parliament at all and normally probably that doesn't matter a lot because normally governments have got such large majorities that on most issues they can, they can kind of get their way through Parliament, essentially. Mm. But clearly, the May government post the 2017 election was effectively running the country in coalition with Parliament. Even with the confidence and supply mm. arrangement with the DUP, we weren't in any kind of stable, strong position in terms of uh, Parliament. And therefore, it was critical that we had a good understanding of both the House of Commons and the House of Lords in order to get legislation progressed. Mm. And so that was something that I felt very strongly about and actually discovered that there were others in the civil service who'd been thinking along the same lines. So that was probably the biggest immediate change that we made. Yeah, and uh, speaking of the DUP, I mean, you came in just after, I think, or no, you, did you join? They were, they were in the process of negotiating that, Gavin Williamson, getting that deal through with the DUP. Yes. But, but from the book, I get the impression you felt you had little control over that and, and little well, say so, into it. I mean, I think it was kind of... So the, first of all, factually, the, the Prime Minister had said on the Friday, yeah. we're going to talk to the DUP yeah. before I was appointed, but the deal hadn't been yeah. done when I was appointed. You know, my view about it was, um, it wasn't ideal, and I understood all the concerns that people raised about it, but it was probably the only option available. You know, Labour weren't going to do a deal with us, the Liberal Democrats weren't after their experience 2010, 2015, the Welsh and Scots Nationalists weren't. So you either were going to have to have another election or an arrangement with the DUP was the only way, given the arithmetic that the 2017 election had delivered, yeah. of ensuring that a government could enjoy the confidence um, of the House of Commons. So we worked quite hard in that agreement to try and address some of the concerns that people had about what did it mean for Northern Ireland if, if one of the Northern Ireland parties was supporting the UK government. But I obviously understood where those concerns came from. Yeah, and we'll get into a bit of uh, the impact on Brexit later. Yeah. Just uh, turning to number 10 a little bit, I mean, it is a quite a small building, especially, and you talk in the book about how, you know, the Prime Minister is very underpowered compared to a lot of their cabinet ministers in terms of the, 
you know, number of advisors, civil servants that they have available. Do you think it's really a fit place to be the centre of power for a modern government, or do we need something more fundamental to change with it? So I, I don't have a strong view on that. Um, so you're, you're right. I mean, you've, you've got a few very high-quality people, mm. but you don't have anything like the bandwidth. You know, if, the, if the Prime Minister's trying to argue with the Chancellor about economic policy, yeah. the Chancellor's got the entire intellectual capability of the Treasury supporting them. The Prime Minister's got two or three key civil servants and two or three key political advisors to back them up in that discussion. You've obviously got the Cabinet Office, yeah. effectively, uh, and I think, therefore, the person you have is either... First Secretary of State, Deputy Prime Minister, CDL, whatever, whatever job title is, the person you've got essentially leading the Cabinet Office and their relationship with the Prime Minister mm. um, is critical. But I think that the reality is that the political power of a Prime Minister in our system waxes and wanes based on their political popularity. I think mm. when Theresa was elected leader of the Conservative Party, you know, she was in a strong position as a new leader and actually performed really well in the polls in the run-up to the 2017 election... And that meant she was a very strong prime minister. Yeah. After the 2017 election, understandably to her frustration, the situation wasn't the same. And the dynamics, therefore, with cabinet ministers weren't the same. Yeah. Um, well, let's turn to some of those cabinet relationships. I mean, one of the things that comes up um, quite strongly, and you talk about the sort of three main relationships, the Chancellor, David Davies on Brexit, and obviously Boris Johnson. Just on the Chancellor, first of all, I mean... Um, you, you're somewhat critical of Philip Hammond for being for stringently pressing for fiscal res restraints, for not always getting the politics, is how you put it. Um, what do you think makes for a, a good Chancellor-Prime Minister relationship? And, I mean, is it always one that's going to be in tension? We're seeing a bit of that at the moment. Yeah. I mean, so first of all, the, the bit writing about Philip was probably one of the hardest bits of the job because I, I both admire him intellectually mm. and I like him. Personally, I consider him a friend. But he could sometimes make things quite difficult. And he wasn't often, you know, he didn't often look at things through the politics of the situation. Mm. Um, I think some tension in the number 10, number 11 relationship is inevitable. Uh, you know, ultimately, the Chancellor is the person who has to say no mm. when Prime Ministers are wanting to do things or say yes, but only if you're prepared to cut here or raise taxes or borrow more money. Um, so you're, you're inevitably going to get some tension. I guess probably in the modern era, the Cameron-Osborne relationship was, was probably the closest uh, number 10, number 11 configuration we've seen where George was really almost sort of part of the number 10 yeah. operation. But I think if you think of most of the other recent combinations, there's always been a degree of tension. There. And I don't think that's necessarily an unhealthy thing. What I tried to do, and hopefully both Theresa and Philip would feel that I had at least partial success in this was to improve the relationship from where I found it when I came in and try and, you know, th although the two of them are not soulmates, they're not miles apart politically. Mm. Um, and actually, some of the best moments the government had, if you think about the long-term plan for the NHS, for example, the significant increase in funding and, and the reform programme that went with that, mm. that was where we were able to get the two of them aligned on what they were, what they were trying to achieve. So I think some tension is always inevitable and it's the job of people doing jobs like mine to try and make the relationship work. Yeah, and very much the sort of behind the scenes. You talked a lot about the relationship with the chief whip as well. Yeah. So sometimes antagonistic. Um, but, I mean, I think most people would see the chief whip as being someone very focused on parliament. Actually, from the sounds of it, they're in number 10 quite a lot of the time, uh, very much focused on feeding to you how the party's feeling. That must have been a very important part of the, the, the role. Yeah, look, I think it, given... The dynamics of the of the 2017 2019 Parliament, the Chief Whip was indispensable. Yeah. Um, because nearly every day we had the risk of votes that we might lose. Yeah. Um, and so having the Chief in the room, how sh how we might go about handling that, and certainly as the Brexit process drew to its um, conclusion, you know, he was an absolutely vital figure. And yeah. he had no Julian had an impossible job in that situation. Yeah. And I think he himself was torn because he had his own personal views on what kind of Brexit he thought was right for the country, which were very similar to the Prime Minister's, wanting some kind of compromise. But he was also conscious that there were plenty of people in the Parliamentary Party that didn't like what she was trying to do, and it was his job to make sure the Prime Minister understood how yeah. strongly they felt. So he was kind of pulled in both directions a bit. Yeah, OK, well, let's turn to that big overarching issue that dominated throughout uh, Brexit. 
Uh, I thought there were some really telling parts in the book where you, uh, I mean, obviously at the start, you talk about some of the sort of big questions that she had to deal with and you try to sort of um, say why, almost why they felt insurmountable to you yeah. to actually to deal with it. Things like obviously the lost election, therefore the loss of the majority, the red lines that she had already put out when you triggered Article 50, um, the sequencing of the talks and, and issues like that. I think one of the most interesting things, obviously we're talking about it again at the moment, is Northern Ireland. Yeah. And you mentioned a moment where you were over in Northern Ireland and what an eye-opener it was for you having these conversations. And that looking back now, your notes sound a bit naive when you said that you wished that um, MPs could come over to hear from people to understand uh, Northern Ireland and why the issues. Um, do you, I mean... You say that it, it was probably naive to think that that would have swayed their minds, but do you think actually we did need a much better understanding of Northern Ireland, the, the issues that um, it would cause for the eventual Brexit deal, and is that part of the problem that we're facing at the moment? Yes. Right. <laughs> so a very um, leading question for so, you. <laughs> so, but, I mean, look, just taking a step back, the yeah. chapter you're referring to is my favourite chapter of the book. So that there's a chapter where it actually came from a conversation with Nick Robinson, right. who was telling me this story about some bloke who'd come up to him in a pub and said... Why is this bloody Brexit thing taking so long? Um, and so the chapter is an attempt to explain to people why it was so difficult to resolve. Yeah. Um, but Northern Ireland is at the heart of that. And I suppose my fundamental argument would be that we never had an honest debate in this country about what the real choices were in terms of the kind of Brexits yeah. that were available. Um, the logical consequence of Brexit... Uh, certainly the kind of Brexit that the Prime Minister uh, would want, where you, you're completely out of the EU's regulatory orbit, is a border between Northern Ireland and Ireland. Mm. You know, if you're an independent country that is not in regulatory alignment with its neighbours and is not in some kind of customs union with its neighbours, you have customs checks and you have reg regulatory checks when goods cross your border. And that is not an acceptable uh, answer in, Northern Ireland, you know, in terms of the Northern Ireland-Ireland border, and we've never really fronted up to what the actual choices were. If you think back to the 2018 conference, mm. when Boris was campaigning against Chequers, he was telling everyone, I'm going to get a trade deal for the whole of the UK with no Northern Ireland protocol. Mm. It didn't happen. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I don't think we ever had that honest debate. And the meeting you're referring to, the Prime Minister met with a number of community leaders who were telling her just how worried they were about the combination of the Brexit argument and the absence of devolved government in Northern Ireland and how mm. it was dragging Northern Ireland back. And it had a profound impression on her. And you know, my observation would be too many people in our politics are complacent that the progress that we've seen in Northern Ireland is guaranteed to stick. Mm. And I don't think it is. And I think the whole way we have handled that issue is putting that progress at risk. Yeah, and I mean, you were sounded quite frustrated on Twitter last night with uh, Lord Frost's speech yesterday, where he's pushing to rewrite uh, the Northern Irish Protocol. Um, you know, Boris Johnson called it an oven-ready deal. Um, how's it looking this morning? Do you feel any sense of optimism about what the EU might announce later, whether we will get to a, a better solution? So first of all, just to explain my frustration. Yeah. You know, I'm not saying that the current situation in Northern Ireland should stay. I don't like... The, this iteration of the Northern Ireland Protocol, Theresa fought tooth and nail mm. to, drop, to knock the EU off this idea of having a Northern Ireland-only uh, arrangement. But my problem is that if you agree something uh, and you fight an election saying what a fantastic deal this is, and then almost immediately afterwards you start trying to unpick the thing, yeah. the danger is the people you're negotiating with think you didn't agree it in good faith in the first place. And that makes it much more challenging when you're then trying to renegotiate it. And my fear is that the prospectus that David set out yesterday, which is basically the entire thing has to be ripped up and you have to accept our version of it, mm. has no chance of success and is going to do even further damage to our relationship with our nearest neighbours. Um, who is going to gain if the UK falls out with the EU? We're not going to gain. The EU's not going to gain from it. Russia and China will be feeling pretty happy about it. Mm. Um, so... You know, I hope when we see the EU's proposals today, because I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm equally cross with the EU, that they're, what they argued for as a solution all along is just as disrespectful of the Good Friday Agreement mm. in terms of East-West trade as a North-South boulder would have been in terms of nationalist opinion. Um, so I hope that they will come forward with some proposals that really are a significant shift. 
particularly on the pragmatic issue of the level of checks that we see between goods. But the UK government has to meet them halfway. And you know, if the two sides can't resolve this, then A, it's going to do very significant damage to mm. our mutual relationship. But B, you know, once again, Northern Ireland is going to suffer because of the inability to come up with a compromise solution here. Yeah, well, I mean, I just want to probe what you just said there about an, having an honest conversation as a government. Yeah. I mean, don't you feel that actually Theresa May herself was partly responsible for that? Because, you know, from the beginning, there was a, you know, a line push that uh, you wouldn't reveal the hand, the negotiating hand. This was some of this was before your time. Um, and also there was then later, uh, you know, a lot of accusations that she was kicking the can down the road, sort of pushing that final denouement between her and the party further and further away. Um, should it have been confronted earlier? I always thought that the indicative votes moment in Parliament was really telling because it was, it was the sort of final moment where it had almost got to, well, what else do we do? And yet still there was an inability for sides to come together and think, well, actually, what do we need to do? How do we face up to this? Yeah. So the indicative mo in votes moment was incredibly telling because they basically rejected all of the options available. But even then, one of the problems was that some of the options in the indicative votes were not realistic options. Mm. You know, they were unicorns, to use the, the term that became prevalent at the time. So the, obviously, the, the book as a whole is very supportive of what Theresa was trying to do. Mm. If I could go back in time... Uh, to when she first became Prime Minister, the thing I would... People often talk about the red lines. Yeah. I mean, actually, the main red line was we're leaving the single market because we're ending free movement. And for what it's worth, and I campaigned for Remain, I didn't want to leave the EU, mm. but for what it's worth, I think she, is, she was right that if you had tried to stay in the single market and the customs union, and presumably people would have wanted to maintain security cooperation, and you would have had to have a fishing agreement to stay in both of those things that would have been indistinguishable from staying in the EU. It's mm. very hard to, for me to see how that solution would have been any kind of acceptable compromise. So that was really the only significant mm. red line, and I agree with her about that. But where I would say you could have done something a bit differently is before you tr triggered the negotiations and before you set out what the government wanted, you could maybe have published a white paper that said, look, these are the choices. You know, the UK could stay in the single market customs union. This is what that would mean. Mm -hmm. It could uh, just stay in the customs union. This is what that would mean. It could have a, could leave completely, but given the EU's position and given our own responsibilities in terms of the border there, there would have to be some kind of arrangements in relation to Northern Ireland and Ireland. It could leave with no deal. Or it could try and pursue some kind of new model, which is what she actually tried to do. So she didn't describe it in those terms, but essentially... Her solution was to try and see if we could have some kind of single market for goods mm. and disentangle the four freedoms, which very difficult to negotiate, but was an attempt to square uh, the circle in terms of some of the difficult choices involved. And I think if you'd set out those options clearly and why other things were not potential answers, we might have at least had a more honest debate amongst ourselves about what the choices were, and it might have mm. helped a bit to resolve the situation. Yeah, well, that's, that's, I mean, that's the conversation with the country and with MPs. Yeah. The other theme in the book is obviously uh, the role of cabinet, you know, the big checkers um, meeting was a, a big moment in yeah. the book. But you talk about how some in cabinet felt excluded from Brexit negotiations and sound a bit, you know, that th th that was perhaps a bit of a mistake. On the other hand, though, you, you accuse Boris Johnson of uh, refusing to grapple with the policy detail, seeing Northern Ireland as just a smokescreen that wasn't the sort of the big issue or, or even pretending that those problems didn't exist. Again, do you think that she, even with her, you know, difficult political position, that she should have forced it to an issue earlier? Should she have sacked Boris Johnson? So, I, I mean, let me take, before I answer that question, let me take a step back. Yeah. I mean, so I think she tried very hard to involve the full cabinet in the decision making. The problem we had was endemic leaking. Mm. I mean, virtually every cabinet meeting that was about Brexit leaked within an hour or so of the meeting closing. And that was extremely damaging to the governance of the country. It made it increasingly difficult to take the big decisions in that format. And so what evolved over time was a sort of smaller um, inner cabinet that she would consult, and those discussions did not leak. But I can entirely understand that some of the people that, that weren't part of that inner group were not the people necessarily leaking. And, and so they would have felt very frustrated by, uh, by that. I can mm. understand it. In terms of um, Boris, 
I think he was frustrated uh, as foreign secretary that um, he didn't have responsibility for the Brexit process. Mm. You're right. I found I found it frustrating that you couldn't get him to grapple with the complexity and the issues around Northern Ireland. Um, but in terms of why she didn't fire people, she was very conscious both of the parliamentary arithmetic and that she was trying to hold the party together on an issue on which she disagreed fairly profoundly. Uh, and I think felt that if she, if she pushed people outside the tent, it wasn't going to make her job any easier. Mm. We've got a question here from uh, Jess. Uh, on, on you know, the conversation yesterday, uh, saying yesterday Lord Frost said that the EU did try to use Northern Ireland to encourage UK political forces to reverse the referendum results or at least to keep us closely aligned with the EU. Do you agree with that? Um, so do I, think, do I think that the EU uh, would have liked the decision to be reversed and us to stay? Yes. And do I think that they talked to politicians in the UK who wanted a second referendum? Mm. Yes. Do I think that they used Northern Ireland to do that? No. I think their concern was twofold, mm. one of which they talked a lot about in public, which was sort of solidarity with Ireland, making sure there was no return to a hard border. The other of which was more uh, an issue for them privately. They didn't make such a big public issue of, which was protecting the integrity of the single market. Mm. But I don't think they used Northern Ireland to try and sort of keep us in alignment. I think there are genuine issues there, which... Um, people have still, are still not really prepared to face up to. Ultimately, uh, you either remain in some kind of customs cooperation and regulatory alignment, or there is a border, Northern Ireland, Ireland, or there is a border within the United Kingdom. There isn't a solution that is going to make that go away uh, as a sort of hard choice. And, and that's what we're still grappling with today. Yeah, it seems like it's still a negotiating move. I mean, Dominic Cummings has been tweeting a lot last night and again this morning, uh, talking about the election and, you know, why do people think that we were um, doing it in good faith? What do, you know, a lot of references to that as getting a bit of backlash. But, I mean, that is a, a sort of key point that, from their point of view, this was all part of a negotiating strategy and a strategy that's still going on. Um, you know, do you think that there has been some successes to the way in which Boris Johnson played hardball? Was there any lessons there for Theresa May? So I think, I think he got one crucial compromise that if she'd got it, she might have been able to get her deal through, mm. um, which was the consent mechanism that's in his version of the protocol that was not in her version. But I think on the fundamental big questions, he's been proved wrong. You know, his assertion was he could get a UK trade deal with no Northern Ireland only arrangements. He wasn't able to do that. Mm. He believed that if he was leader, not Theresa, Philip Hammond, David Gort, Rory Stewart and co would all back down and follow his lead in, in advocating a no deal. He was wrong on that. Mm. Um, so, you know, th there is one crucial change that he got, and I think you have to give him credit for that. I'm very happy to do that. Uh, but I would argue that we're still not faced up to the reality. If you want Britain, as David Frost and Boris Johnson do, to be an independent country with complete control of its own regulatory policy, then the consequence of that is a border between Northern Ireland and Ireland. Mm. All right, let's move away from um, Brexit again for a minute, just before we get any more questions through about that. Um, another thing I want to, and I'm going to link this to a, a question that we've got um, uh, from Tom. Um, I wanted to ask you about, I mean, at the moment we're seeing energy supply chain crises going on. It feels like it's almost a sort of rapid, even after, you know, the very um, difficult COVID experience we have, we've still got rolling events yep. hitting number 10 hard. How much does the urgent crowd out the important and what can number 10 do to protect a prime minister for that, to make sure that they're focused on the sort of chronic long-term issues and not just those immediate ones? And then Tom's question is, who influences the, the prime minister or the chief of staff most? Media, MPs, staff, civil servants, constituents or others? The last one's a really good question. Yeah. Um, so does the, if the first one's an easy one to answer. Does the urgent often crowd out the, the important? Yes. Um, and, you know, you fight a constant battle against that. Mm. Uh, to, to my mind, you know, it was one that I felt we were, we were sort of drawing with initially, and then as Brexit became more and more tortuous, we, we lost, essentially, and it began to dominate everything. Um, but what I tried to do was reserve chunks of space in the Prime Minister's diary to look at some of the sort of long-term issues, and one of the things I say in the book is that in mod modern politicians spend far too much time worried about the media and trying to announce new policy mm. to dominate the airwaves rather than actually looking at 
are the policies that we have announced? Have they actually been implemented? And if they have been implemented, are they having the impact that we hope that they would have? Are they working in the way that we uh, intended? So the first question, I think, is a fairly easy one to answer. Um, the second question, I mean, I think there are, there are lots of influences, and a little bit it depends on the political situation. Mm. So if you're in, as Theresa was, if you're in a very difficult parliamentary arithmetic, then obviously you're heavily influenced by uh, what, the, what, what your feedback you're getting from the parliamentary party, the, the WIPs office, essentially. That's a significant factor. Um, civil service obviously has not a monopoly, but a, but a quite a strong position in terms of the advice that is coming to ministers, who ministers are hearing from. Um, I think the media remains reasonably powerful at setting the news agenda. Mm. You know, the, if, if, you, if you were a fly on the wall in the Prime Minister's morning meeting, yeah. I suspect quite a chunk of that would be devoted to what's come up in the media, because if you're the Prime Minister's official spokesman, you're going to need a steer every morning from the Prime Minister about, if I get asked this at lobby, how am I to answer that on yeah. your behalf? And, and just a quick question on that. I mean, um, obviously, Donald Trump famously all over Twitter 24-7. Um, there was always the he's awake moment. Um, I get the impression Theresa May didn't really use Twitter very much, even to promote herself, let alone to read the news. Did she read the news herself, or did she get it all from you? No, you she would, she would, she would, she would read it herself, but she yeah. didn't obsess about it. I think yeah. she had a reasonably thick skin, which I think is an important quality in a prime minister. I think if, if as prime minister you're reading the papers yourself and contacting editors or journalists and complaining about or saying it's not, fair, you know, that's not a great mm. look for a prime minister. I think. Um, in terms of social media, her starting point was, was very sceptical about it. And actually, over time, we managed to convince her that there was a role. Um, she, didn't, she didn't use it in the way President Trump did, clearly. Yeah. Um, but I think she saw that as long as uh, it was focused on the issues that she cared about and she felt it was authentic, she became more comfortable about it. And it's noticeable that she continues to use it a bit, having left number 10. So I think her view changed on that a bit over time. Yeah. Um... I've got a question here from Drew Smith that says, what is your view on SPADs all effectively reporting to number 10? Actually, I think, I mean, you use the SPAD network similarly. I don't know how much you think there was a difference between that and what was reported about how Dominic Cummings was using it when he first got into his post. So um, I don't, I mean, obviously, I'm a, there I would only be basing it on what I've seen reported yeah. in the papers. Um, my, my view is that the main reporting line of a special advisor is to their minister, and there's a dotted line to the prime minister. So I think number 10 should definitely be trying to coordinate the network, mm. um, but it can't, it can't try and run the entire thing. Uh, and I think Dominic was obviously in a stronger position to be able to exercise that control because the prime minister he reported to was in a stronger political position than Theresa was. Yeah. One of the things I say in the book, which I, which I accept is um, paradoxical, is that I actually think ministers spend too much time with their political advisors, that one of the changes that we've seen in politics over the last... 20 or 30 years, is that senior ministers spend less time in each other's company, partly mm. because the, the sitting hours of parliament have changed, and this army of advisers has grown up around them. So they spend more and more time with their advisers and less and less time with their colleagues. And actually, particularly when you get into a really difficult political situation, how your senior colleagues feel about you and the relationships you have there are really important. So I end the book, I think, by saying, if I went back in time, the first thing I would say to Theresa is, you know, spend some more time with two or three of your most senior colleagues. Mm. Um, and so a couple of questions here which are quite interesting on um, particularly your model because um, you're the only former politician, uh, this is from Heath Pickering, uh, to have been a chief of staff to a prime minister. It's also not happened in Australia, Canada or New Zealand to his knowledge. I don't think I can think of one either. Um, why don't more former politicians work as chiefs of staff? Um, they know the government apparatus, they uh, know the party well, it's a senior political-like role. Um, and there's also a question from Raymond Newell who says, given the shortcomings of alternative models explored by Brown and Johnson, uh, has the role of an explicitly political chief of staff now become a permanent fixture of British government and the Prime Minister's office? This actually goes to what we said we were discussing before the event yeah. about do we need more continuity yeah. in how uh, Number 10 is, is operated, more institutional memory around the role? So, and there's a lot there, as try to answer yeah. it briefly. Um, do we need more continuity? Yes, although I don't think you can have it sort of set in stone because, you know, if you take the current Prime Minister and his predecessor, they're very different people and they're going to want a, a different style of operation uh, around them. 
I hope that the, the, the role of a political chief of staff will become a permanent fixture. I think it is an important role in making number 10 uh, function effectively. Uh, it's worth saying it's only an accident that I got this job. Um, you know, it, it happened because of the unique circumstances of the mm. 2017 election. Theresa clearly felt she needed to make a change and she needed to rebuild relationships with the parliamentary party. So I think that was the logic that led to pick an ex-MP uh, to replace Nick and, uh, mm. Nick and Fee. Um, but I, I felt that the, that experience that I had, both as a minister in terms of relations with the civil service and as, a, as an MP and, and as a whip, you know, I knew all the parliamentary party well, that it, it served me very well, really up until the last few months. Mm. There was a lovely moment when, when, I, when she went to the first meeting of the 1922 committee, I went in with her and she announced my appointment. And for me, there was a very emotional moment where I got a very warm welcome from all my mm. former colleagues. Now at the end, they were probably of mixed views about whether I should have had the job or not because of the way Brexit um, played out. But certainly up until the denouement on Brexit, I would hope that Conservative MPs felt that having someone who knew them and knew the, kind of the jobs they had to do and how Parliament worked in that job mm. was an asset. But you also talk in the book about how there were limits to what you could do because you were you know, borrowing her power effectively. And at other times, it was the role of David Liddington, Chancellor of the Duchy yeah. of Lancaster, or before him, Damien Green, as First Secretary of State. We've now got a Deputy Prime Minister, but he's actually in the Ministry of Justice uh, and instead got somebody else in the Cabinet Office. Do we need a Deputy Prime Minister in more than just title alone? Uh, not necessarily, I think. Um, uh, again, I think it depends on the dynamics, the, the situation and, and the needs of the Prime Minister of the day. Uh, David Liddington played an invaluable role for Theresa mm. in, the, in that, particularly in the last period of her premiership, when really she was almost completely absorbed in trying to find a way through the Brexit maze. And he did a lot of important work uh, in terms of devolved government's relations with them, in terms of chairing some cabinet committees and brokering some of the disputes between cabinet ministers on domestic policy. So I think a prime minister will always want a senior lieutenant in the cabinet office, mm. whether they have that title of deputy prime minister or not. Uh, and it will always be useful to have someone that when they're absorbed with a crisis, you know, a figure who is sufficiently senior that the, their other colleagues will accept them kind of standing in for the prime minister. Mm. Whether you need the formal title is another question. Um, got another question here from Anonymous, which I feel might be one of my colleagues upstairs because we're thinking about this at the moment. Uh, when thinking about communications between Number 10 and government MPs, how important were informal means like WhatsApp? Was she on WhatsApp if she wasn't on no, Twitter? No, uh, she, she wouldn't have used WhatsApp a lot to communicate with most of her So people didn't have her, her number like they Some, A few did, yeah. but I mean, I mean one, one of the things I say in the book is that the system, by which I mean ministers, MPs and senior civil servants, a quiet, is quite respectful, well, certainly with her, was quite respectful about going direct to the Prime Minister out of office hours. Mm. Uh, they weren't so respectful about <laughs> contacting the Chief of Staff. So I would, like, I would have a queue of people that would form at my desk during the working day looking for a steer, and over, you know, in the evenings and weekends, just constant phone calls from people saying, what would, you know, could you put this to the Prime Minister, or what, what do you think the Prime Minister would think about that? Yeah. Um, so, no, she, she, she didn't use WhatsApp... Uh, regularly as a communication channel um, with MPs, but clearly comms between Number 10 and the Parliamentary Party is, is absolutely vital. And I think the more rapid the media cycle becomes, the more important it's become that MPs know what line Number 10 is taking, how it's dealing with the situation. So you've got to balance between the kind of short-term issues where MPs need to know where Number 10 is, mm. and, uh, and also some of the sort of communications about longer-term strategy, understanding what it is that you're trying to do, the, the private research that the, the party is conducting, sharing that with MPs, so they understand how you're trying to navigate through the situation that you find yourself in. Yeah, I've um, got another good question here from Caroline Turnbull Hall saying, do you think that history will be kinder to Theresa May than her critics were at the time? She was clearly highly principled and trying to deliver the outcome of the referendum and the backstop must have been a better outcome than the protocol. 
Um, I kind of want to ask that, but also, um, you, you know, one of your chapters in the book is actually called What You Can Achieve in Two Months. It's almost like once she knew she was going out the door, suddenly there was a long list of things that she wanted to achieve yeah. and be remembered for. Do you think it's going to make a difference to the history books? Well, so, so definitely, I think the biggest single thing she did, she did in those last two months, which was to legally commit the, com the, the country to net zero carbon yeah. emissions by 2050. Um, the, the last two months, I think, are interesting because I think they show you what a... Theresa May premiership absent Brexit would have been like. If she'd, if she'd been able to get Brexit done mm. and move on to sort of politics as normal, they give you a sense of what kind of prime minister that she might have been. Um, in terms of how history will judge her, I'm, I'm, I'm biased. It's a really difficult question for me to answer. Uh, I, people are not going to change their minds, or most people are not going to change their minds on Brexit. So the people that liked her compromise will continue to like it. The people that thought it wasn't a proper Brexit will continue to think that. And you're not going to get past the, the headline on her premiership, which is that she couldn't get Brexit done. Mm. But I, I hope that three things will also shine through alongside that. One is her character and her commitment to public service and diligence, which Caroline was talking about uh, in the question. Two uh, would be some of those domestic achievements, the NHS plan, the net zero commitment, the race equality audit. I think they're at the... You know, the mm. And, and actually, although Boris uses different language, so he talks about levelling up, but the sort of place bit of the industrial strategy is very similar. There are lots of similarities in terms of the domestic approach between the two of them. And then thirdly, I think she deserves huge credit for staying in Parliament. I wish more of our former prime ministers had done that. Mm. Uh, you don't have to agree with her to think that having someone who's done that job in Number 10 and seen some things that most MPs don't get to see brings a really important pers uh, perspective to the House of Commons. Mm. And I think it's really to her credit that she has, she values being the MP for Maidenhead. She values her place in Parliament and, and is able to make a really important contribution to political back. And I've been quite touched that even people who don't always agree with what she's saying mm. think it is important that she is there and, and saying it. So I hope, you know, I don't think you can change... The, old, the facts of the ground on Brexit, as it were. Mm. But I think there are lots of things to admire about her. And I think as time passes, more and more people are seeing that. And, and what about you? I mean, you know, she stayed in the, in the House of Commons. You've moved to the House of Lords. Would you uh, consider back into ministerial life if the, if the call came again? So I don't think the current Prime Minister is likely to ask Possibly me, given our, given our differences of opinion on Brexit. Yeah, that's something that, that maybe later in life is something that I would consider. You know, I've given, uh, I've given my life to politics. I, I believe very strongly in public service. Um, you know, the, the opportunity to do that job in number 10 mm. was, was an immense honour and privilege. Um, and so I certainly wouldn't rule out playing some role at some point in the future. But at the same time, at the moment, I'm working with some hugely talented people in the private sector who actually, it's a complete culture change for me, but one of the things I've found really positive about it is that they also are very passionate about some of the complex problems we face in society and how from their different perspective, the contribution that they can make mm. uh, to dealing with those things. So I suppose probably um, if, I, if I was looking back at the last five or six years of my career, the lesson is you never know what the future holds. Okay, final question then, I'll give it to Richard Goff, um, which is quite a good one because I think it goes to the point about what's the sort of most, you know, awkward revelation that you had to put in the book about the thing you did and what's the, you've already talked about some of the things you're most proud of. It says, what advice would you give to any incoming chief of staff to a prime minister? What would you advise them never to do that perhaps you did or to do, which perhaps you might not have? So um, to the two first things I would say to them is tell truth to power. Mm. Uh, I think until you've worked in that building, there are very few people who want to tell the Prime Minister to their face something that the Prime Minister doesn't want to hear. And it's a very important bit of the job. Um, and obviously it has to be done very delicately and, and nearly always in private or with only one or two other people in the room. But all Prime Ministers need someone who can sometimes say to them, that isn't right, you shouldn't, you shouldn't do that. Um, so that, I think, is, would definitely be one thing. And the second thing that I would pick out um, would be a bit of advice that I picked up from a book 
called The Gatekeepers, which is a, an incredible book, which is a history of the mm. Office of Chief of Staff to the President of the United States. And this advice came from um, John Baker, the, uh, who was, uh, sorry, James Baker, Jim Baker, who was Chief of Staff to Reagan and to Bush Senior. And he doesn't phrase it quite this pithily, but essentially what he says is, job title, Chief of Staff, the important word is staff, not chief. The world will treat you sometimes like you're the second most important person in the British government. Mm. But you're not a minister. You've got no mandate of your own. You're not there to uh, drive policy in the direction you think it should go. You're there to make the government of our country do what the Prime Minister wants it to do. And all of your authority comes from the Prime Minister and you need to remember that. And so one of the things that I did um, was that in the whole period that I worked for her, I never referred to her as Theresa. Even if it was the two of us in private, I called her Prime Minister. And rather amu it amused her, it took about four months after she'd mm. left like, to stop doing it so deeply ingrained was the habit. But I thought it was important both for myself to remember that, but also to show other people that were in meetings that that was the relationship. Yeah, well, interesting to know what they, um, whether Prime Minister now still gets the same... Uh, approach. Okay, that's it for the uh, for today's event. Thank you for watching. Thank you all for the great questions. Apologies to those uh, those questions that I couldn't get to. Uh, and many thanks to Gavin Barwell for a fascinating conversation. Uh, the event will be available to watch again on our website shortly. And of course, uh, Chief of Staff Notes from Downing Street is already available in all good uh, bookshops. So uh, we mentioned it earlier, net zero is obviously another very lively topic and you'll be pleased to know that we've got another IFG event coming up in just over an hour, how to make COP26 a success. Uh, we've got a fantastic panel, including the Prime Minister's COP26 spokesperson, Allegra Stratton. Uh, so go away, take a break, uh, make a cup of tea and do come back and watch that. Thank you very much for joining. <laughs>